on a night like this with a cold rain outside. It makes you think of the verse in the Dhammapada, where the Buddha says, if the mind is not well developed, it's like a hut that hasn't been well thatched. It's going to leak. Rain can leak in. In the same way, when the mind is not developed, passion can leak in. When the mind is well developed, it's like a hut that's been properly thatched. Rain can't leak in. Passion can't leak into that kind of mind. So how do you develop the mind? By trying to get it into right concentration. Because you develop a lot of skills in the process of getting your concentration right. On the hand, the Buddha talks about the well-developed mind as being one that's resistant to pain. In other words, pain comes and you're not overwhelmed by it. That's paired with being developed in body, which he says is being resistant to pleasure. You have to learn how to be resistant to both. In other words, don't let them overcome the mind. And you do that by getting the mind still in the proper way. When you're dealing with pain, you have to have your techniques, you have to have your strategies. You don't just sit there with the pain. You're trying to figure it out, what it is about physical pain that pains the mind. And there's stages to doing that. The first stage, of course, is not to focus straight at the pain. Gather your forces in another part of the body that you can make comfortable with the breath. And learn simply to accept the fact that if the pain is in the knee, the pain can have the knee. If it's in your waist, it can have your waist. If it's in the middle of your head, you, it can have the middle of your head. You can be someplace else. Good lesson in not self. But also it's a good lesson in looking around and seeing what strengths you do have, what you can do with the breath to give the mind a good place to stay. Then when it's well gathered, then you can think of the good energy you have there where you are focused and spreading it through the pain. The pain is in the knee, and think of it going down the leg through the knee and out the foot. If it's in the head, think of it coming up through the neck and going out through the eyes. Or coming up around from the back of the head and then going down through the front of the neck, down into the chest. There are lots of ways you can visualize this. The important thing is it gets you so you're not afraid of the pain. Then you're ready to investigate it, to see what perceptions are making you use the pain to stab the mind. And if you can replace them with perceptions that are different, like the one of the pain being just little pulses not a solid block. And the pulses are going away. They're not coming at you. They're going away from you. They arise and only to disappear. They may be replaced immediately, but those ones will disappear too. You learn to chop up the pain into little bits so it's not so overwhelming. So those are some ways of using your concentration to learn how to develop the mind so that it's not overcome by pain. Then there's the question of not being overcome by pleasure. You can sit here, and the breath gets really still, very quiet, and the mind gets quiet, and then you lose focus. What's happened is that you've dropped the breath. Maybe because the breath was too subtle, or simply because the pleasure that came with the breath was so much more interesting, more enjoyable. So you drop the perception of the breath and you just go wallow in the, in the pleasure. And then you come out and you realize that you've totally lost your alertness.
the way to deal with that is, as soon as the breath gets comfortable, is to give your mind work to do in the comfort. In other words, work on spreading it around. Make a survey of the body from the head to the toes, from the toes to the head. Noticing where the breath energy is flowing well, where it's not flowing well. What you can do to straighten it out. And then doing your best to try to develop a full body awareness. So you're aware of the head and the feet and the hands, and every part of the body all at the same time. In other words, when things get comfortable, realize that you've been given some energy. Use that energy to get the mind fully established. There's a phrase in the Pali, which can be translated as having your entire awareness focused. It's all here. Now, even though there is pleasure, it doesn't overcome your alertness, it doesn't overcome your mindfulness. These are some ways in which right concentration can help you so that you can have what's called a developed mind and a developed body. But the practice of right concentration also helps in other ways. You're developing two qualities, tranquility and insight at the same time. This is a point that's really misunderstood. People just equate right concentration with tranquility, and the insight is someplace else. But the Buddha never taught that way. He says if you want to develop calm and insight, you've got to get the mind into jhana. And if you want to get the mind into jhana, you've got to develop tranquility and insight. They work together. Because as you're getting the mind to settle down, you have to understand the workings of the mind. And that's what we do when we engage in directed thought and evaluation, particularly the evaluation of what's going on. When the mind is settling down, what's working, what's not working. And if it's not working, trying to figure out so it does. To understand that, you're going to have to look at the mind in terms of the processes of fabrication, the breath, the direct of thought and evaluation in and of itself, your feelings and perceptions. What is it that's out of balance? What is it, what is it that's wrong? What needs to be changed? It's only when you get to know the mind like this that you can get the mind into a right concentration. Are there ways you get the mind just to settle down and be really still? But it's not going to be right if you don't understand the workings of the mind. It's in that way you're developing insight. And of course, as the mind settles down, it becomes more tranquil. The Buddha says when you develop tranquility and insight to a full measure, this is how you can get develop both awareness release and discernment release. Awareness release is when you're released from passion. And this can be passion for pleasure, passion for all kinds of things. But the Buddha was wise enough to see we're not passionate only for the pleasures, we're passionate for the passion itself. We like it when the mind has that flow of energy. But that flow of energy that goes out to things, that's one of the ways that the effluence manifests. When you get the mind really calm, you can see that. You may have had this experience as you, say, do walking meditation, and your mind goes flowing out, but you don't go flowing out with it. You see it go out a little ways, and it stops. Say, so, okay, there it is. That's the flow of the mind. When the, the Tyajans talk about the currents of the mind and the flow of the mind, this is what they're talking about. And you begin to realize how much you've been riding with those flows all along. But then they drown you, they turn into floods. So as you develop this quality of tranquility, in other words, keeping the mind really, really still, you can detect movements of the mind that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And you begin to see the things that you were passionate for in the past are not really worth it. You see the effort that goes into churning passion for these things. 
And so the mind gets into awareness release. Discernment release, the Buddha said, gets rid of your passion for ignorance. Someone asked today, how is anybody passionate for ignorance? Well, we're passionate for wrong views. Because after all, what does right view tell us? It tells us we're suffering because of our own actions. And there are a lot of people who don't want to hear that. It's also telling us that suffering is something you don't have to accept. But again, it's going to take work to get past it. Some people say, well, I'll just learn how to put up with it. I'll be okay. All of that is being passionate for ignorance. Of course, that means you're going to stay stuck in that suffering. You even see some modern Dharma teachers, they don't like the Four Noble Truths. They tell us that they're not noble, they tell us that they're not truths. They tell us that the word for origination doesn't mean origination, it means result. In other words, suffering results in craving. But that doesn't give us any idea of well, how you're going to get rid of the suffering. It's basically saying you have to put up with a craving. So there are lots of different ways you can be passionate for ignorance. And a lot of it comes down to laziness, willingness to put up with things that you don't really have to put up with. The Buddha says, look, you don't have to suffer at all. There is a dimension that can be touched by the mind. There's absolutely no suffering, no limitations whatsoever. And yet we put limitations on ourselves because we're afraid of the work that needs to be done. When you begin to see, though, that the way you put things together is causing suffering, and you don't have to put things together that way. There's another way. This is how insight cuts through seeing that it's not necessary, that suffering. You have an alternative. Go for it. Now, when you develop the mind in this way, you're getting the right balance in your concentration. You're balancing both insight and tranquility. As John Lee points out, the insight is there in the evaluation. The tranquility is in the steadiness of your directed thought, or your singleness of preoccupation. When concentration is right, it's really balanced, and has all the elements of the path. So this is how you protect the mind so that passion doesn't leak in. When it rains, the rain doesn't come in. In other words, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, ideas, they can come. But they don't have to penetrate the mind. That's the message that the Buddha gives. But it does require work. We're not just letting go, letting go. We're also developing. But it's good work. It's work in a sense of well-being. Work where you're not being judged by outside arbitrary standards. There's no panel of judges holding up signs that say 6.0 or 5.0 or 4.0. You can see for yourself. When the mind is developed, it's more and more protected. But the important thing is that you get your concentration right. Don't go just for a comfortable hour. Go for an hour where there's lots of mindfulness and lots of alertness. Where you have that quality of 
your entire awareness is focused. And that's how you keep the rain from leaking in.